So you might not know this about me, I keep it pretty close to the chest after all, but I like video games. And that like runs pretty deep, because video games have pretty much been a core feature of my being since day one. I have all these old memories of games for like Winnie the Pooh and Arthur from PBS that I played on CD-ROM using my family's computer that I genuinely have no idea where they came from. And while those games were neat, they really just laid the foundation for what would become my most important style of media. Video games as a medium have pretty much become my entire entertainment source, so much so that I've had to start making these videos just to have a space to talk about how much they mean to me. And while I love Cyberpunk 2077 enough to make almost two hours of content focusing around that game, while I've played enough of that game to rack up over 200 hours, what I've found is that I can't really talk to other people about it. Because when I tell people that I spent 214 hours playing Cyberpunk 2077 this year, they always give me that kind of wild look. Like, my dad will hear me say that, and he sort of looks at me like, wow, that's over five work weeks spent playing a video game instead of changing the oil in your car, Thane. But like, I drive my car once a week right now at most, man, the oil is fine. This is still a good benchmark though, you know? 200 hours gets some wild looks, so it's probably for the best that I don't mention my 1100 hours in Kerbal Space Program, or how that's not even my most played, or second most played game. Unless, of course, you're watching me here on YouTube because you like the stories I tell about games. So here, on YouTube, I would like to tell you the story of my three great obsessions. I don't really remember being super into space when I was a kid, or even during my growth into a young adult. If I honestly had to try and pinpoint it to any one thing, it would be the fact that growing up, one of my most often repeated gift requests was for Star Wars Lego sets. I have no idea why they were so common, but I got loads of them as a child, and honestly, I had a lot of fun building the little plastic replicas of all of the different spaceships, so when I, a few years later, stumbled across Scott Manley doing all sorts of neat things in Kerbal Space Program, it only really makes sense to me that I was hooked. Kerbal Space Program, or KSP for short, is a lot like Legos. Kind of. You get to throw a bunch of parts together to make a spaceship, sure, but that's about where the similarities actually end, because while things like Atmospheric Drag and Delta V were things of no consequence to my LEGO creations, the Kerbals who put their lives on the line to test my ludicrous designs had very strong opposite opinions. Kerbals are, of course, the native denizens to Kerbin, a pleasantly Earth-adjacent little rock, third from the sun, in a quaint little solar system with plenty of neat places to go explore. And they're a quaint people who live simple, basic lives of being strapped into never-before-tested rocketry, and if they're quite lucky, they might even survive to tell the tale. Of course, rockets aren't the only thing that KSP lets you play around with. You've got a hangar for building planes, both space and otherwise, and you've got all sorts of little doodads to build up things like rovers or cars or little habitats to do science with. And of course, the big pull of the game is that once you've built your little car, you're going to think to yourself, oh boy golly, I sure wish I could drive this car around on the moon. And then, with a little elbow grease, a handful of tutorials, and a bit of basic knowledge in literal rocket science, you sure can drive this car around on the moon. There's a lot of things to love when it comes to Kerbal Space Program, and that starts with choosing how you want to play. More than any other game I can think of, KSP really lets you take the reins when it comes to deciding how your game functions, because on top of having a whole suite of different sliders and toggles for customizing your difficulty, the game also presents you with three different game modes, these being Career, Science, and Sandbox. Career is what I would consider sort of the canon-style game mode. You're responsible for managing every aspect of your burgeoning space center, you need to balance your hiring, your marketing, your contracts, you'll need to make the call on which aspects of your space center deserve the priority on individual levels of funding, as well as what new technologies to unlock with all of your scientific discoveries, and you'll need to maintain a good reputation with the public throughout all of that because, surprise, the public won't be impressed if you keep strapping new hires and public thrill seekers to barely functioning rockets and losing them to faulty landing tech and improper staging. So if that all sounds like a little too much to handle right off the bat, then perhaps I can sell you on the science mode instead. Here, all efforts and global concern for your agency are exclusively towards the idea of pushing the boundaries of what is and isn't known. Hundreds of Kerbals may die, but that's a sacrifice that the whole world is ready to make if it means that we can figure out what this little box of goo does when exposed to lunar gravity. Each little discovery lets us unlock new technology, and that new technology lets us build bigger and better designs, letting us push even further beyond our little blue dot. Personally, I recommend starting on sandbox mode. Here, every part is available to you right off the bat, and you have no restrictions about the kind of vehicles you can make or how many Kerbals you can condemn to an immolation-based passing as you learn the basic mechanics. 
It is a great place, risk-free, to learn about a lot of things, like Delta V maps, or gravity assists, or like how you shouldn't try to just do a straight shot straight upwards to get a moon intercept. I mean, you can do that, there's just a reason why NASA doesn't. KSP is sort of an open world in the same way that I understand Skyrim's open world. While the world itself is, admittedly, not terribly interesting to interact with, the fun of exploration doesn't come from the world itself, but rather all of the toys you get to use to explore the world. Just in engine types alone, we have so many different avenues by which we can ascend to and explore the stars. Liquid fuel engines are great because we can control the flow and thereby control the speed at which they burn, but if you just need some bulk lift to break away from the surface, let me introduce you to solid fuel engines. They have one setting, on, and they'll be on until they run out of fuel, at which point you'll want to cut them loose, just make sure they're fully empty first. Once we get into orbit though, that's when we can start getting crafty, because we can use things in a vacuum that don't really work well in atmosphere, like nuclear or xenon engines. Both of these are designed as a sort of min-max style engine, low output for highest efficiency. Of course, there's a difference even between those two, because while the nuclear engine is sort of a sweet I'll just go play some runescape on the second monitor while this burn happens, xenon is a bit of a sweet I'll just go to work while this burn happens kind of vibe. And that might sound like a pretty boring adventure, and it honestly kind of is, but when you get to where you're trying to go and you've still got 4,000 meters a second of Delta V, you'll be happy that you still have 4,000 meters a second of Delta V. Hey, Thane, you keep saying the term Delta V, are you going to explain that? No. Go play the game and learn the cool things for yourself, because KSP is a game that I highly, highly recommend. The game is basically finished with no more grand updates planned, which means that, like Skyrim again, the modding scene for this game is phenomenal. Stable games really let that happen. KSP was the first game that I ever learned to mod, and the process is so dead simple that it genuinely gave me the confidence to start playing around with mods for other games too. When I first got into PC gaming to play a different game that we'll talk about later, the idea of altering my precious games with mysterious third-party files was a nervous, intimidating notion, but KSP made a great learning experience, and honestly, I think that's what I would describe KSP's entire existence as in a single sentence. There's a brilliant XKCD comic joking about how playing KSP is when things like orbital mechanics really start to make sense, even if you have a job and a degree in the field. And while I wouldn't want to ever overstate how this game can help you envision and get hands-on with highly complicated mathematical procedures, well, this was the game that helped me visualize how goofy certain movie scenes are, because despite my love of Revenge of the Sith, this just isn't quite how space works. So. If you were ever into playing with Legos as a kid to make Star Wars spaceships, if you enjoy conquering difficult physics problems, or if you just think space is neat and you want to explore it in a setting more grounded by our own natural laws, I highly, highly recommend Kerbal Space Program. RuneScape is a game that I started playing in the 2006-ish era, and I just never really stopped. Now don't get me wrong, I've taken some serious breaks from time to time, as I think most healthy RuneScape players will tell you they do, but RuneScape isn't really a game that you quit. It's a little difficult to figure out where I want to start with explaining RuneScape to you, because with a game this old, a game that has been this integrated into the general knowledge of the internet this well, I'd wager that everyone knows about the game, even if they don't know the game, you know? Like, I could start by introducing it as the medieval clicker simulator from your childhood, or I could introduce it as a game that's had one of the greatest schisms in internet culture ever, or I could introduce it as the game that's so addictive I genuinely know of people who will play the game on their phone while they're at work and then come home from work to keep playing it on their PC. Honestly, I think it's going to be best to just introduce it to you as the game that defined what RPGs should feel like to me. Despite everything that RuneScape does really well, the biggest, most important thing to me is that it's an entirely classless game. You're able to swap between any style of activity, be it fishing, to mining, to woodcutting, at any time, just as easily as you're able to swap between using magic or greatswords or crossbows. There are absolutely no game-based restrictions on what you're able to do with a character. And all this led me to develop such a specific taste in games that when I finally tried out World of Warcraft and got a cool looking drop only for the game to tell me that, oh, sorry man, that's a warrior weapon. You can't use that, you're a hunter. That I thought to myself, wow, that's not interesting at all. Which is like, the entire reason I keep coming back to Skyrim so often. The idea that I can form a character around whatever self-imposed or desired archetype I can imagine from the age of like 9 or 10 is what I've been trained to identify as peak game design, because it is. And what's especially neat is that while RuneScape doesn't have classes, it sort of has classes. More specifically, it has a bunch of player-made archetypes. 
You see, RuneScape has both individual levels for skills like attack, strength, magic, etc., but those combat skills also correlate to your overall combat level. Now, the actual equation in the background that determines how many levels in any given combat skill will increase your combat level is a more complicated thing than I quite frankly care about, but some more invested people than me eventually did the math and learned that by ignoring certain combat skills or by capping them at certain levels, you can maintain a larger advantage at different PvP brackets. And these different archetypes, called Pures by the community, can get really, really specific. You've got the one defense pure, which is about as simple as it sounds, glass cannons with high damage, low defense. There's also the obsidian mauler pure, which uses low attack, high strength to fall into that I only need to hit you once style of gameplay. There's also one of my personal favorites that I ran for a while, the berserker pure, named for the special hat that we'd always wear, designed to sort of help bridge the gap between the aforementioned two other pures. Of course, if you're looking to play more into the PVM and questing side of the game, then playing a main, the term for an account with no restrictions, is pretty much the way to go. But just the fact that RuneScape presents itself as a game that allows and encourages players to define their own limits has become one of the biggest appeals of the game to a huge crowd. In late 2018, RuneScape YouTuber Settled started a new series where he artificially locked an account to an area of the game called Mauritania, with the goal of the account to eventually conquer the raid in that area, known as the Theater of Blood, exclusively with gear collected in that area. All in all, the whole series is 5,000 hours condensed down to just over 12, essentially one man pushing both the game and himself to the absolute limits. And all this might make RuneScape sound like a really hardcore thing, and honestly, it can be, but it's important to remember that RuneScape is, at its core, one hell of a sandbox. You see, the game doesn't really have an overarching story. Rather, there are quest lines in the game, sort of self-contained stories for you to interact with, but the biggest appeal of the game to most people, I think, is the ability to choose the kind of journey you want to have. If that's hardcore-style region restrictions, then yeah, go for it, but there's a lot of things to do and explore across this world, and largely, you're able to do that at any pace or direction that you personally find interesting. So, do I recommend RuneScape? Um. I'm not really sure. In truth, the game is kind of in a weird space right now. What was once a childhood clicker game has sort of evolved into a hyper-efficiency arms race, with more and more mechanics to abuse the game's tick system being used all the time. While once upon a time you'd use whatever weapon you found neat, try going to sand crabs with a longbow and see just how long it takes for someone to call you out that you should be using darts instead. And I do kind of get it, you know? RuneScape is a game that involves a great deal of grinding, and a 3% advantage over the course of 10 hours really does add up. But I still can't help but feel that a bit of the game's soul was lost as its player base grew up. Because even though I've made way more progress in the 13 days that I've been playing on my current account than in the 62 days I played on my childhood account, guess which one I had more fun playing. Here's what I'll say. On November 15th of this year, an event called Leagues either starts or started depending on when this video goes live. Hell, it might even be today, who knows. Leagues offers a bunch of fun stuff, noticeably wildly boosted experience rates, nearly cutting out all of the grind aspects entirely. If anything I've said sounds fun, I think you should give Leagues a try, and see if any of the mechanics are worth sticking around for. Um. I'm hoping this kind of feels like a wild left-field curveball to you guys, because I do truly hope that people think me better than being the kind of person who plays this much League of Legends. On the other hand, of course, I'm fully aware that League has a bit of a reputation to precede it, and while that reputation isn't earned unjustly, I do think the game deserves someone to tell you that its bad reputation is not the sum whole of the experience to be had here. And if there's any game I'm honestly genuinely qualified to tell you about, it's this one. The 150 days calculation is some rough napkin-style math because League doesn't make it easy to figure out your total number of games played. Sure, after a match on Summoner's Rift, you're told these numbers, but if you've ever played Ranked, for example, that's its own number that resets every season, and it's not clear if those games also contribute to this number, too. And that's not even accounting for games spent on different maps or game modes, some of which don't even exist at this point, so there's no way to even get an endgame screen for them, and none of that is accounting for the napkin math only involving one single account when I played fairly routinely on a total of three, which you only really ever do if you play competitively, which I did. At my peak, I was in the top 0.4% of players in North America, placed somewhere in the top 4,400-ish range of players. So to be frank, there's never been anything I'm more qualified to tell you about. And I can tell you that I think most people only know League by its reputation, and while there's more to it than that, I'd also tell you that that reputation comes from a real place, and I think that place is best summarized by the understanding that, 
losing feels twice as bad as winning feels good, and no game feels better to win than League of Legends. This leads to a place where players are, obviously, highly mentally motivated to win. But League is not a single player experience, nor is it a simple one-on-one. -on -one. It's five people versus five other people, and for a while, at least, I've understood League's innate relationship to its players to be, you need five players to win, but you only need one player to lose. To win, everyone has to be at least willing to work together. To lose, you only need one person that doesn't want to win. And when the average game takes around 30 minutes to complete, with some of the more extreme games going all the way up to 70 minutes in my experience, there's a huge time-based incentive towards wanting to win, and losing that, despite playing your role well, or losing because you're fully aware that you're not playing your role well, is a really uncomfortable thing for people that are taking it seriously, and that leads to unhealthy places, and all of that is before we even factor in that aforementioned competitive play. When you are playing on League's main game mode, you have the choice between Normal and Ranked. The game is exactly the same between the two, but Ranked comes with a small number attached to it that lets you know how well you play the game compared to other people. And this small number is fully capable of making people lose their minds. Partially because we enjoy the things we're good at, and inversely want to be good at the things we enjoy, but also because League has a seriously large global community with professional scenes in every major region, including a Worlds tournament that's either going on right now, or is just ending depending on when this video has gone live. And for a lot of people who find themselves good at the game, there exists this idea that if I can just get good enough, I can play the game professionally and I'll get to play the game I love all day long. Of course, it's not that simple, it's never that simple, but it doesn't stop it from being the idea. And it doesn't stop people from forming a deeply damaging relationship with the game. And if that was it, I'd have a very easy time telling you that I don't recommend the game. But of course, it's never that simple, because despite being a game that, in my younger years, once made me so angry that I genuinely broke a monitor, I also have to tell you that it's a game that made me a far more functional person. See, I fell into the category of people that wanted to play the game professionally, and for a while that led me to some really unpleasant places, especially when I wasn't seeing the growth that I wanted to see for myself. But eventually, I started to get the hang of it. I started looking at actual coaching, looking for other people who could help me grow, because yes, this is another video where I talk about the human condition and the fact that we're stronger together. Gotcha. And once I found that I was starting to grow, once I found that I was getting good at this game, I realized that all the same tools I used for the game were things that were just as valuable outside the game, and tools and techniques that I developed for the game are still things that I use to this day. Sometimes when things get to be a little bit too much, the best thing you can do is just walk away. Not forever, necessarily, but just long enough to breathe a little bit. Of course, to do that, you need to be able to tell when a situation is too much for you, and almost comically, stress is the kind of thing that can make it really easy to not notice how much stress is affecting you. So it's not enough to just go outside and touch some grass, you need to be able to recognize the signs of when it's time to go touch that grass. And honestly, I learned that from League of Legends. The amount of times I would lose two ranked games in a row and a like clockwork say the words aloud, time to breathe, while walking out of the room is pretty big. It's a technique that got me through some of my most difficult times at college, when an assignment or a topic was just too much for me in any one moment. The moment I started to feel that telltale sign of my brain going a bit too fuzzy, those same words would slip out. Time to breathe. And I've even used them at jobs that I hated, working in production and getting the call that I was going to stay until 2am even though my shift is supposed to end at 11.30 because that's just the way the cookie crumbles and if I don't like it I can go find a different job that won't make ends meet? Time to go breathe. Because sometimes stuff just doesn't work out. Sometimes you just have to put up with things you don't want to, and whether it's right or wrong doesn't matter. And you can lose your shit, or you can learn to recognize when it's time to go breathe. If you've watched my content for any amount of time, you've probably caught on to the fact that I'm a pretty big fan of teamwork and the notion that we all lift together. And a huge portion of that came from League of Legends, from recognizing that aforementioned issue that we need all five of us to win a game. And that means that even if you don't like someone, even if you don't have any desire to work with someone, sometimes you just have to work with them anyways. And you don't have to like it, you don't have to like them, but you have to figure your shit out anyways, you need to get over that part of your ego because it's that or failure. And surprise, that carries over into way more things than just League of Legends. The ability to put your personal feelings aside and focus on a bigger picture is something that I think everyone needs to learn to be able to do, and even though it's kind of embarrassing to say, 
I learned how to do that thanks to League of Legends. What's more, League of Legends helped me solidify what I consider a critical piece of wisdom, that being the understanding of when it's time to step up versus when it's time to bolster someone else. League has a lot of things you can do in any given game, and in a game with so many decisions to make, it's not always easy to figure out the right options. But if you want to win, if you want to play at your very best, you need to become good at figuring out what those right options are, and how to communicate to your team what needs to happen to meet those objectives. But more importantly than that, you need to be able to reconcile with someone else trying to do the same thing. Because when your team is trying to pull a heavy load, pulling in a direction that's a little bit different than where you personally think is best, is still miles better than trying to pull in two different directions at once. In short, League of Legends taught me when to step up and take charge of a situation, and it also taught me to recognize when it was time to get behind someone else and back up their ideas and solutions. Do I even need to tell you how often learning to be a good team player has helped me in my life? So, do I recommend League of Legends? Honestly, not really. League is kind of my special 3600 hours, it absolutely dominated my life, 2 out of 10 do not play kind of game. And largely, it's because the learning curve for this game is kind of more of a learning wall. There's something like 165 champions to play in the game right now, and with every champion having at least 5 abilities, including their passives, that means that just to have a ground level foundation for what every character can do, you'll need to at least know the vibe of over 800 individual instances of mechanics. And that's not even accounting for learning to recognize how all of those mechanics work together, like how Orin's charge can break Anivia's wall, or how well Malphite's ultimate ability synergizes with Yasuo's ultimate ability. And I won't even mention how wacky the jungler role is, because honestly, Riot Games really seems to insist on changing it up every chance they get. But if you can get past that, if you can dedicate the time to learning all of those mechanics and seeing how all of the pieces of the puzzle come together, well, there's no game that feels better to win than League of Legends. So this wasn't really an essay in the usual format. I'm not really interested in digging into any of these games in any sort of deeply analytical way. Rather, I was just thinking about how much time I've spent in games like Cyberpunk and Baldur's Gate this year and how those don't even hit a fifth of the time I'd spent in Kerbal Space Program. And after hearing John Green once talk about the notion, one of the big guiding ideas for my channel has been learning to pay attention to what I pay attention to, and like, hot damn, man, 1100 hours is a hell of a long time to pay attention to something. So, if you're still watching the video to this point, if you're still paying attention to my content, then maybe you're the kind of person that would be interested in helping make this kind of content possible. The people who make the jump over to my Patreon page to help back the content I make are not only incredibly high quality people, a role that I assign them with entirely no bias, they're the people that really help make this content I produce feel rewarding. So, if you can, it would mean so much to me if you'd follow the link and see if there's a tier that works for you. Thank you.